Here we are. So Sophia Hammer, Rudy, real time learning to update dense retrieval indexes. Thank you. Oh, what? Yeah. You have a microphone there. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, John Maria. So I'm Sophia Altama, and I'm happy to talk to you about Rudy, which is real time learning to update dense retrieval indices um, for production systems. So this is an abstract paper. So I would love to hear your feedback and your discussions about the open challenges we see, or you might also see additional reasons. So. So in uh, Rudy, we are concerned with dense retrieval models. And in the talk yesterday from Jimmy Lin, we already saw that dense retrieval models are bioencoder models, and they demonstrate great effectiveness gains for first stage retrieval. So therefore, the question which, uh, the question which, came, which came to us was, how can we use those dense retrieval models in production systems? And then specifically, in uh, search indices for production, we were concerned with the que question, how can we update those dense, re dense retrieval indices um, for the new content? So in production, new content um, not only needs to be included in the index, but there's also a content shift. Maybe new relevant items comes or the relevance changes over time. And this content shift needs to be accounted for in the indexing model. And as re-indexing, the whole uh, corpus in uh, production time is very computationally expensive. We propose the concept of real-time learning to update the dense retrieval index with simple transformations. So first, I will go a little bit into dense passage retrieval models. So dense passage retrieval models are bioencoder models, which use language model BERT to embed the query and the documents in the corpus. And then the relevance between the query and the document is scored um, given the doc, uh, with the doc product between the query and the document embedding in the vector space. So a vector space embedding is learned for the query document and the passages. And then the relevance is just um, the nearest neighbors of the embeddings. And those dense passage retrieval models achieve great effectiveness gains for first stage retrieval compared to traditional um, first stage retrieval models like BN25. So now let's go into the gradual content shift over time. So here on the left hand side, you can see an ideal vector space embedding um, from a dense uh, retrieval index. So the uh, query document is embedded with a vector denoted with Q here, it's a black, uh, black vector. And then the two green uh, vectors um, denote relevant items in the um, corpus. So they should be ideally closer to the query document than the irrelevant documents, which are denoted with the red vectors. So, but then over time, new content is added to the index and we potentially have new relevant items, um, which are also embedded with the, um, dense retrieval index uh, model, but the embedding does not fit to the new relevance. So the new relevant item is maybe further away than irrelevant ones. So we need to account for this content shift um, and take this into account by retraining the indexing model. So and with retraining the indexing model, we would ideally get a new embedding space where the new relevant items are closer to the query document, which they're relevant for, than the irrelevant ones. So this is how we, one would account for the new content in the index, and not only add the new content to the index, but also account for the new relevance. So now the question appears, how do we update this index in um, real time? Because updating the dense retrieval index is computationally very expensive because um, embedding the documents in the corpus um, needs passing um, the documents through the BERT model. And you can do this offline beforehand, but this is computationally very expensive and time consuming. And therefore it is not possible to index the whole corpus in real time in production systems. So therefore what we propose is to update the index with a learned simple transformation function between the old and the new vector space embedding. 
So this is the concept Rudy, which we propose. So with Rudy, we would have three phases. The first phase would be to sample embeddings from the ideal new vector space embedding, and then use those samples from the new vector space embedding to learn a lightweight and a simple transformation between the old and the new vector space. And this transformation should then approximate the old, um, no, the new embeddings given the old embeddings from the old vector space. And with this transformation, then one could update the whole index um, from the old vector space to the new vector space, but it would be um, very lightweight and simple and therefore possible in real time. So with this concept, we see some open challenges which we um, want to address. So the first one would be, how can we retrain the dense retrieval model um, so that it accounts for this content shift? And then we would also need to analyze the shift of the vector space embedding. This would be the first challenge we see. The second one would be how to learn this updating transformation. We thought about different transformation functions like exponential transformations or linear transformations. And then also how could we learn this transformation function and here we would also like to um, investigate different sampling strategies, how we sample from the new vector space embedding, um, and then overall investigate the retrieval effectiveness um, between updating the index with Rudy, but or updating uh, the index by re-indexing the whole corpus. So, and as we are interested in real-time updating the index, we would also do some speed comparisons we would uh, compare the speed of updating the dense retrieval index with Rudy versus re-indexing the whole index. And then we would also investigate different sizes of training samples for learning the transformation. Another challenge we see is the evaluation on fixed test collections here um, does not account for this content shift. And therefore we would need to uh, use updated collections like the track COVID collection, or we would also need to evaluate in production systems, for example, with A and B testing. So yeah, what I really wanted to take home is that dense retrieval indexing models need to account for the content shift if you want to use it in production systems. And that with Rudy, we want to learn this updates using a simple and lightweight transformation function between the old and the vector space, uh, new vector space embedding. So I'm happy to hear any feedback, any questions. Um, yeah, and I'm happy for the discussion. Thank you. Yeah. Questions, Omar, Arjen, and from here. Wait here, otherwise it doesn't work. Pretty good idea. And, and I wonder if you want to consider the notion of using tiers for your updates in the sense that if you you know a traditional web search engine will have top tiers usually if you know places you know websites like wall street journal see tier one then you have tier two and then tier three and then the, the junk mm -hmm. so if you want to update maybe instead of like sampling mm -hmm. you want to consider tiering mm -hmm. as as a top tier you, you want to just basically maybe just move everything but you do more sampling as you kind of degrade on the quality of the tiers. I don't know if it's going to work or not, but mm. that, that may be something to consider. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thanks. Nearly said that we learn from the past, uh, Omar. <laughs> you need to step further forward <laughs> for the mic to work. Um, the new world of problems. I was wondering, so what type of lightweight transformation do you think can um, uh, then uh, propagate the update in the transformer? Did you think about that already? So first of all, I thought um, I thought about the problem as um, transformations between two vector spaces. So first, I was thinking about linear transformations between the vector spaces. I think this would be the most easy and most lightweight um, idea. But um, I was also thinking about exponential functions, for example. Um, yeah, these are um, just ideas I had. Um, yeah. And do you think that you could maybe uh, 
also use the structure of the transport, like all these layers, they mm -hmm. they have the attention and yeah. then the old model and they come together, go into the next layer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe that you can skip a lot of the work. Yeah, yeah, maybe that's a good idea. Maybe one could just look at maybe the upper, just only the upper layers get updated with the most changes if you further train the indexing model. And then we could also just use, use at the upper layers and what happens there. That's that's a good idea. Yeah. Well, interesting idea to work on. Uh, very good idea. Thank you. Okay, a better talk. And then, um, yes, I have a couple. Okay, sorry. Thank you. To be first or second row. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I had a curiosity and a couple of comments on that because I have been working on something similar. So I was wondering, uh, you've been like, do you have any examples of like a situation where you needed to update your basically encoders for dense retrieval? Because in my mind, like a dense retrieval model like BERT, for example, like you know, learns to encode information like in a sort of fixed and stable way that should mm -hmm. be maintained over time. Maybe yeah. I, in my mindset, like. I would I would expect more like to the need to update the, the upper layers like about subsequent uh, element in a retrieval retrieval stack for example mm -hmm. rather than the the actual encoding. But I was wondering if you had any example of where you where you felt the need for to update the encoder rather than the yeah, subsequent, subsequent elements of a retrieval model. Yeah. So I'm not sure if I understand the, the question correctly. What I was mainly thinking about was, for example, when track, uh, when COVID appeared, like this is a lot of new knowledge which is, which is developing very fast and there's a lot of new items coming and um, the, the model would need to um, account for this new knowledge which appears in the web and also um, the knowledge shifts and changes so rapidly, so quick. So this is what I think what why starting point was how can we include this in 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 the indexing model yeah i don't know if this answers the question or yeah maybe you can rephrase it yeah sure so no that that, that answers uh the question is maybe we can carry the conversation later over lunch because it's a really interesting topic i don't want to yeah, take too much time but yeah thank you thank you for the answer yeah. yeah thank you so I have more like a practical question. So if you say that we are going to use it in production, where we, let's say, I don't know, update this, uh, using this model every day, the, uh, the model. So did you do any, or do you plan to do any efficiency comparison between using this light transformer uh, as opposed to the, uh, like retraining everything? And do you have an idea of the, like the percentage of computation you need per transformation already? No, I don't have an idea, but this is exactly one challenge which, which I would love to address and to see how many new samples do, new, do I need to sample from the new vector space embedding to learn a transformation which is reasonably good enough to maintain the retrieval effectiveness, but at the same time, um, not sample too many of the new uh, embeddings um, to still have a um, yeah to still have a, uh, yeah more speed in um, updating it and also um, losing less um, yeah computational um, resources also yeah considering the environmental impact of it. And uh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, and I assume that, um, let's say we do it on a daily basis, and uh, obviously it introduces some error, right? So every day we are accumulating on the error that we have by estimating the retrained uh, dense mm -hmm. retrieval model. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be useful also to like give a recipe or a rule of thumb mm -hmm. for people like, okay, you need to do this transformer for a month, let's say. Yeah. But at that point, you reach a level of error that you really need to retrain. So the, the efficiency does not mm -hmm. account for the effectiveness. So mm -hmm. I think finding this trade-off is also an, an important thing. Yeah, 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 I know what you mean. And I also think it makes a lot of sense to like 
uh, to analyze how often do we go in the wrong direction and when should we actually re-index everything or does this even happen? Yeah. Thank you. And we have one question online. Let's go for it. Should I read it? Well, out? that's Laura. With Laura. Could you... Oh, I, I I just raised my hand. Sorry, I wasn't sure that that I was present online. Um, okay. so I so uh, thank you so much for your talk. It really made me think in a completely different direction, and I was wondering whether your idea would actually naturally fit in a n plus one layered neural network. Okay, what do I mean by that? Um, let's say you have a fixed document collection. You train a layered model of let's say n layers. Mm -hmm. Um, kind of like to to like maximize that the dense retrieval quality. Now you get a new document and you want to know how should my underlying representation change? And you can sort of like see this as adding another layer on top of your current model that sort of like takes all the previous one, all the previous embeddings, adjusts them, and maybe it takes your new documents, represents them in the old space, and also adjust them. So kind of like between layer n and layer n plus one, this is like where you actually learn your lightweight transformation. And now you get the next 10 documents, you keep on doing this one, now you have a like n plus two layer. And this actually, you might think that this is now getting really difficult to learn with gradient descent, but you know, especially in the light of catastrophic forgetting, what people were doing is to actually freeze certain layers so now your first n layers are frozen and you just add an n plus one layer and that's the only layer that you train. So everything, all your adaptation and your lightweight transformation must be absorbed in the n plus one's layer. Yeah. And I, and I think that I'm wondering kind of like how, how this would sort of like naturally fit with your idea or like naturally incorporate your idea. Actually, this idea with adding another layer to like fit to the shift this was actually my first idea before thinking about transformations between vector spaces. Um, and then I think I was, I was thinking about adding layers, but then I thought it would, like if you do this on a daily basis or in a, on an hourly basis, like there are so many new layers um, that like um, computing the, the embeddings for new documents from like BERT and then N plus K layers, would get so computationally expensive if you add and add and add layers. And I think this is why my idea switched more to the transformations um, because then you would, you would, yeah. So I'm thinking if your first end layers would be frozen. Yeah. Right. So you still would need to keep the latest parameters around. So there's like some, some limit how far you can go. But your first n layers are frozen, so like you can see this like mathematically equivalent to just being one layer that sort of like encapsulates all of that. So you will only ever train one additional layer whenever you get whenever you get new documents. So in terms of like training, training shouldn't be too hard. The only problem is that encoding and decoding you still now have like n times the latent parameters, and I and this is what I'm saying. I think it might be probably a limit to how far you could push that. Yeah. So actually I was not thinking like, so you, you do retrain the dense retrieval model and then you could, you could fix this as the frozen layers and add another layer as the transformation step. Um, right, then only the transformation layers are actually trained. Sorry, I can see Gemma Maria being like, uh, like nervous in the background, sorry. No, no, I'm not nervous. I wanna, I wanna say well, I created- a conversation, but that's fine. <laughs> like, wait, but, by the way, I created a Slack channel. I don't know whether Jan Maria told you. In doubt, ask him about the Slack channel and not hide the information so we can discuss this further in the future. Yeah, yeah, we'd love to. Yeah, yeah. Send the link. 